Every family has its heirlooms, but the royal family has over one million of them. Known as the Royal Collection, this artistic treasure trove holds everything from the crown jewels to royal portraits, precious ornaments and priceless sculptures. The Royal Collection is the biggest private art collection in the world. It really has an unbelievable amount of objects. It's the world's highest quality grab bag into which you can dive and find practically anything. The Royal Collection is estimated to be worth £10 billion. The Royal collection is the envy really of the world and certainly the envy of the art collecting world because it is so unique. And behind every painting, jewel and work of art lies an extraordinary story. Tonight, we reveal the secrets of the Queen's art collection. The spy at the centre of royal power. How do you feel about being called a traitor now? I can't deny it. The alleged art fraud. This was a staggeringly embarrassing incident for Prince Charles and for the royal family. The art world is famously murky. The royal family are not immune from that side of the industry. The suspected jewel heist. This was one of the great jewellery heist mysteries of the 20th century. And the truth behind some of our most celebrated national events. It actually snapped on the morning of her wedding day. This is the secrets of the royal art treasures. Behind palace doors, largely hidden from view, lies one of the royal family's most magnificent assets, the royal collection. We often quantify the Queen's huge wealth in terms of palaces, but we mustn't forget the royal collection. There's one million objects, it's valued at 10 billion. The royal art collection holds a vast range of items that includes much more than just paintings. The Royal Collection is one of the largest and most important collections of art in the world. Drawings, paintings, sculptures that form part of this collection um, and they are spread around 13 different residences including Buckingham Palace and Holyrood House at Edinburgh. With some 7,000 paintings, a vast number are royal portraits and one face appears time and time again. Our Queen, Elizabeth II. More than a hundred artists have painted the Queen, of course, but very often the occasion for a portrait, whether painted or photographic, has been some memorable occasion. Right through from the coronation through to the Queen's 80th birthday to the Great Jubilees. By sitting for a portrait, the Queen is making herself accessible to the public. So I think it is a, another way of, of the monarch um, communicating to her subject. I here present unto you Queen Elizabeth, your undoubted queen. One of the most iconic of these images captures her on the day of her coronation in 1953. The photo was taken by renowned society photographer Cecil Beaton. It looks as though the Queen is sitting in the Lady Chapel at Westminster Abbey, but actually this portrait was staged in the throne room at Buckingham Palace using a photograph of Westminster Abbey as a backdrop. And that really underlines that element of theatre that is always part of royal portraiture and pageantry. It's this young, glamorous queen in her full robes, but Cecil Beaton spoke, wrote about her purity of expression. When our queen took the throne, the nation was recovering from the aftershocks of World War II. Rationing had only just ended, and the bitterness over the abdication crisis of 1936, when Elizabeth's uncle, Edward VIII, renounced the throne, was still very raw. I have found it impossible to carry the heavy burden of responsibility. The monarchy needed to project an image that spoke of a new start. Beaton really captures that sense of optimism for the future, I think. There's also a sense of her steadfast gaze out of the frame of the picture, looking towards the future. Cecil Beaton's iconic photo was a masterclass in royal PR. The monarchy's power and majesty is reinforced in every detail of the photo. 
Everything about the picture is symbolic. She's wearing the imperial state crown. In her left hand, she holds the orb, and in her right hand, the scepter with the cross. She's sitting so poised and alert right at the center of the picture. And the way the robes fall around her, they create this very stable pyramid in the picture, suggesting perhaps the stability for the country of the arrival of this new monarch. An official painting or photo of the Queen has been added to the royal collection at regular points throughout her reign. Each one is a chance to mark the progression of her time on the throne. In amongst the formal portraits have been some surprising works. In 2012, the Queen bought four Andy Warhol prints of her own image for the royal collection. Well, the image of the Queen is probably one of the most powerful and instantly recognisable images um, in, in society. I mean, she is immediately familiar. Warhol's arrival at his London gallery is like a royal progress. Andy Warhol was a founding father of the pop art movement. He took images of the world's most famous faces and reproduced them over and over, as if they were more mass-produced commodities than works of art. His work is considered a comment on the nature of fame in the 20th century. Andy Warhol, he was the man who invented the saying, we all have 15 minutes of fame. In the Queen's case, it's an awful lot more. And I think what he's trying to convey here is what happens when you repeat an image so many times, that the way the public engages with these famous figures is more with the trace of the person or the idea of what they represent rather than the real person underneath. Although it's not known how much the Queen paid for this item, other Andy Warhol prints of iconic celebrities have auctioned for over $80 million. While the Warhol portrait cemented the Queen's status as an icon, other portraits in the Royal Collection have been noticeably less glamorous. In 2000, she agreed to be painted by controversial artist Lucian Freud. Many people complained that it made her look lined, lumpy. It really isn't a flattering portrait. At the time of this portrait, Lucian Freud was the biggest name in British art. His pictures would sell for nearly 20 million pounds. And by the time he died in 2011, he had accumulated the largest estate of any British artist, 96 million pounds. Although the most successful artist in Britain, his portrait of the Queen met with controversy. I think it's fair to say that the portrait provoked mixed reactions when it was first unveiled. I think the Sun newspaper said that Lucian Freud should be sent to the tower for painting this picture. The Queen's portraits in the Royal Collection are surprising insights into her personality. With works by both Lucian Freud and Andy Warhol, she's marking herself out as more modern than she's often thought to be. I think it's very interesting that she wished to connect herself with this absolutely avant-garde, cutting-edge artist and being very wily and astute at realising that these artists have a lot of pulling power and that if she is represented by them, she shows herself to be a modern woman in touch with cultural and artistic uh, values of the day. By using portraits to communicate with her public, the Queen was continuing a tradition that goes back to Henry VIII. But it was not until Charles I started collecting art on a mass scale in the 17th century that the foundations of the Royal Collection were laid. The Royal Collection, as we know, it really kicked off with Charles I. He was like a little boy in a sweet shop. He began the Royal Collection on a staggeringly high level. Just as our own Queen has done throughout the 20th century, Charles I filled the royal collection with portraits that projected a positive image of himself to his subjects. Charles I found the perfect painter for his royal propaganda campaign, Dutch master Van Dyck. 
Charles appointed Anthony van Dyck as his court painter in 1632 because he realized that van Dyck had the skills and sophistication to be able to strengthen Charles I's public image and to promote his royal authority. Charles I's reign would come to a bloody end with defeat to parliamentary forces in the English Civil War and his public beheading. But in 1633, the increasingly unpopular king wanted to persuade his subjects of his divine right to rule. Realizing the power of his image, he commissioned Van Dyck to paint one of the most striking works in the history of royal portraiture. It shows him on horseback coming through an archway and it's a splendid symbol of royal portraiture at its most magnificent. The king himself was actually a small man, uh, five foot four. He looks like a giant on the back of his steed. The way he controls the horse almost is an emblem of his own ability to hold the reins of power, that he is bestriding the British nation. He has the nation in his control. Once completed, Charles I found an imposing place in which to hang his new portrait. It was deliberately placed at the end of a gallery in St James's Palace so that if we were a courtier or a visitor coming in would be confronted with what looked like um, the king on horseback coming towards us. Like those who went before her, our queen continues to connect with the British public through the images she commissions of herself. But the royal collection not only holds paintings, it also boasts some of the most famous and valuable jewels in the world. And when the queen really wants to dazzle her public, nothing brings a sparkle to the royal family like the crown jewels. The Queen's artistic treasures, known as the Royal Collection, form the largest private art collection in the world. Many of these some one million items are publicly displayed at Buckingham Palace and galleries around the country. Yet the collection's most iconic items are kept deep inside the Tower of London. It is here that the Queen's most cherished artifacts are guarded, the Crown Jewels. The crown jewels must surely be among the most dramatic and visible signs we have of our history. For almost a millennium, the Tower of London has been considered the safest place. And really, where else would you keep this staggeringly valuable, staggeringly impressive collection? The crown jewels are the items used by the monarchy in sacred and historic ceremonies, most notably the coronation. The crown jewels really are the most powerful symbols of British monarchy. It's often called the regalia, made up of entirely different objects. There's 143 of them, I believe. Crowns, scepters, plates, spoons, trumpets, all of them are encrusted with these incredible stones. I mean, you never see such big diamonds and pearls and, and rubies. They're the, they almost look so big that you think they have to be fake, they're so huge. There are nearly 23,000 individual jewels embedded in the regalia of the crown jewels. Each one adds something different to the, the crown jewels, not only in terms of the, the value of the, the stones themselves, but the symbolism and the history and the culture of, of, of the jewels themselves. With some of the largest and most valuable stones in the world, debate rages over the value of these historic items. What is the value of the, the crown jewels? That is a very interesting concept. Do you value it on the actual the commodity itself or the addition of the, the cultural history? It's priceless. I mean, if you saw one of those jewels in the open market, you'd immediately know and you'd tell the Queen. But there's some estimation that they could be worth five billion. So that's an incredible sum. Every year, two and a half million visitors see the crown jewels in one of the most heavily guarded locations in the capital, the Tower of London's Jewel House. 
the chances of stealing these are very slim indeed. There is um, a round-the-clock protection operation that includes 22 guards, 100 security cameras and bomb-proof glass, which means you simply cannot get through to get those jewels. Of all the regalia on display, it is the crowns that generate the most fascination. The crown jewels has three main crowns. St. Edward's crown, the Imperial State crown, and the Queen Mother's crown. And the two that our Queen wears are St. Edward's crown and the Imperial State crown. The last and grandest symbol of all is the crown of St. Edward. The St. Edward's crown was used to crown the Queen in the historic coronation ceremony of 1953. So the St. Edward's State crown has the arches, it is the heaviest, it weighs a whopping two kilograms. So when you're sitting there waiting to be crowned and two kilograms comes onto your head, it, it takes a lot of practice. In fact, the Queen practiced very diligently for her coronation, putting books on her head, really to practice what it would be like to carry two kilograms of jewels on there. Although St. Edward's crown is the most symbolically important of the three in the royal collection, it doesn't hold the most valuable stones in the crown jewels. The St. Edward's crown has 444 stones, but a lot of them are semi-precious, like aquamarine, and it doesn't have the gigantic diamond or a gigantic ruby that the imperial state crown has, or even the queen consort's crown, the queen mother's crown. It can be had, we believe, for a bargain price of 32 million. Once the queen's coronation ceremony was completed in Westminster Abbey, St. Edward's crown was exchanged for the lighter but more valuable imperial state crown. The Queen, now wearing the imperial state crown, leaves the chapel to the strains of the national anthem. Which is probably the most instantly recognisable crown. It is the one that the Queen wears every year for the state opening of Parliament. My Lord's pray be seated. It has some 2,868 diamonds and weighs over a kilo, and the Queen has said that you actually can't look down while you're wearing that crown because it is so heavy to wear. So when you, you see this thing actually moving, it's a shimmering mass of light with all of these major stones set within. The third crown in the royal collection is not actually worn by the Queen. Known as the Queen Mother's Crown, it was made for Queen Elizabeth, consort of King George VI and mother to our current Queen. The Queen Mother wore it for the 1953 coronation. Since then, it's only been used in a royal ceremony once. When the Queen Mother died, it was placed on her coffin, and it won't be worn again until we have another Queen Consort, and that will definitely be Princess Catherine, who will become Queen Catherine next to King William. And will it also be worn by Camilla? Will she be crowned with Charles? The current approach of the royal family is that she will not be queen consort, she will not be crowned, she will be, her title will be princess consort, but we shall see. The crowns may be the most symbolically important items in the royal collection, but it is the jewels encrusted on each one that really dazzle the crowds in the Tower of London. The royal family owns some of the most splendid, extraordinary and expensive jewels in the world. And those sparkling diamonds, one of which is worth £400 million on its own that sits in the sceptre, I think really represents the splendour and the glamour and the wealth of the royal family. Known as the Cullinan One, this stone is the largest clear-cut diamond in the world at 530 carats. The Cullinan One is a remarkable stone. It's almost flawless. It's a beautiful white transparent stone, pear-shaped. The Cullinan One still remains the most supreme white diamond in the world. The Cullinan One was cut from a vast stone found in South Africa in 1905. This diamond, the largest ever found, yielded three other jewels, the Cullinan II at 317 carats, found in the Imperial State Crown, and the Cullinan III and IV turned into brooches. While the Cullinan I is the most expensive diamond in the world, according to experts, the true value of the four Cullinans lies elsewhere. I think the real value lies in how they're tied with British history and how they have shaped our history and our culture. And so I think it'd be a very difficult thing to actually value. 
Although each jewel holds a unique story, many have controversial provenance. The Kohinoor diamond that sits in the Queen Mother's crown has a particularly checkered history. Although its origins are unknown, it was in the possession of rulers based in South and West Asia before coming into Queen Victoria's possession in 1849, when the British East India Company defeated the Sikh Empire in Punjab. It's very strongly felt that it was not bought and not obtained fairly. It was obtained under the force and oppression of empire. And therefore, the governments of India, Afghanistan, Pakistan and Iran have claimed it and said it is theirs. And so far, the British government have refused to give it back and said it belongs here. Unlike the Kohinoor, the discovery of the Cunanan is very well documented. It was found at the Premier Mine, owned by a South African mining magnate, Thomas Cullinan. This was probably the greatest historical find of any gemstone in the whole world. A worker was looking at the surface dumps and found glinting in the wall this huge crystal. Took this out of a pocket knife, took it up to the mine office and weighed it and studied it and they had in their hands the largest diamond ever found at 3,106 carats. Absolutely incredible. Preparations were made for the stone to be transported to Britain, where Thomas Cullinan's agents would put it on sale. And then once it was going to be shipped by boats to England, a replica was made, and the actual real stone itself um, went via just normal post, in the post, and the actual replica went in a special armed guard as a decoy stone. The stone went on sale, but due to its high price tag, remained unsold after two years. It was eventually purchased by a South African politician and gifted to King Edward VII in 1907 as a symbol of unity after the Boer War. The stone was then transported by a train to Sandringham. It had its own first-class carriage with the Royal Detectives, the head of Scotland Yard, took it to King Edward VII and the rough stone um, was gifted to him on his 66th birthday. With the largest rough diamond in history at his disposal, the king now had to decide how to cut it. Diamonds are very strong, and so they had to find a person who would, you know, be very careful and not damage the stone in any way. And so uh, the, the great company, the celebrated company, Ashes of Amsterdam, were appointed to cut this stone. And so they came to London, they studied the stone for a week to find out how to cut this thing. And remember, this stone is fist size, it's as big as my fist. Joseph Asher was ready to cleave the stone. Um, he lined it up, he put the chisel in the top, smacked it with the hammer to break it, and the chisel broke. After another attempt, the stone was cleaved into four separate diamonds. The four Cullinan jewels are now the showpieces in the crown jewels. But beyond the items in the Tower of London, the royal collection is rich in other priceless regalia that bestow splendor and authority on whoever wears them. As well as the jewels and the crowns in the royal collection, which bring incredible visual splendor to the royal family, um, coronets are also very, very important. Um, they are essentially smaller crowns. And I think probably the most famous coronet is the one that was used for the Prince of Wales's investiture. The coronet for sovereignty. Prince Charles's coronet took center stage in his 1969 investiture ceremony. It's incredibly unusual. It's got an orb at the center of the piece with quite futuristic spikes around it. So it's immediately recognizable. The Royal Collection provides the star items for any coronation or investiture. Yet weddings too are given a dash of glamour with treasures from the Queen's personal jewellery box. We're most used to seeing tiaras at royal weddings, but we also see them at state receptions as well. And they are usually gifted within the royal family and handed down from one woman to another. So there is that historical link. The tiaras are what we all have in our head when we think of a princess fantasy Disney style. On her wedding in 1947, the Queen wore the Queen Mary fringe tiara given to her by her mother. There's actually a great story behind it. 
in that it snapped. It actually snapped on the morning of her wedding day and a palace aide had to rush it to the jeweler to uh, mend it and then rush it back. And if you look very closely, you can actually see the break there when it uh, snapped because these are very delicate items. More recently in 2018, Meghan Markle wowed the crowds at her wedding when she wore the Queen Mary diamond bandeau tiara. But it was reported later that the tiara generated controversy behind palace doors. Meghan had actually set her sights on another tiara from the royal collection, which wasn't deemed suitable because it allegedly had stones from Russia which wouldn't have been suitable for a royal wedding. It has been speculated that Meghan's first choice was the Vladimir tiara, an item thought to have joined the royal collection after the Russian Revolution in 1917. Encrusted with emeralds rather than the more common diamonds, it could have been an unusual choice for a wedding tiara. So she was strongly urged to go for her second choice, and she did look beautiful in it on her wedding day, but the story is that there were tears and tantrums behind the scenes because Meghan didn't get the tiara that she wanted. Tiaras, like the crowns and the coronets, are the epitome of royal glamour and historic symbolism. But the extraordinary riches held by our monarchy are not only used to dazzle the public. Because when Great Britain really wants to impress a visiting dignitary, there is nothing more thrilling than the treasures of the royal collection. The royal family's art treasures form an unparalleled collection of paintings, jewellery, tapestry and objects. And these treasures serve a purpose when the Queen holds a state visit. The Queen normally hosts about two state visits every year. A president or a king or a queen comes from a different country and a very central moment of this is when the Queen takes the head of state on a personal tour of the royal collections and they will see the treasures and they very often are shown various items that refer to their country. The director of the royal collection will draw up a list in conjunction with the librarian who is based at Windsor Castle and they will then draw up a list, pass it on to the Queen, discuss with the Queen because obviously you don't want a vast array of items but enough to whet the appetite of the visitor just to give them an idea of what the royal collection has and what it's all about when the obamas came to visit they were shown a first edition of the book you know birds of america which i think the value on the open market was something like 11 million pounds they were shown a first edition of harriet beecher stowe's uncle tom cabin signed by the author, which, you know, has particular relevance for the first black president. And the queen, apparently, she herself is very up on the artifacts around the paintings at Windsor. She, after dinner, will often take visitors on a tour, telling them exactly what they're looking at. A state visitor is not only shown the treasures of the collection, but they'll also get to eat from one of its finest items. A state banquet is a glittering occasion, and a lot of that is due to the incredible dinner service. And this is George the Fourth dinner service. It's silver and gilt, and it's just gigantic. 4,000 items. It took 25 years to assemble. And when the full banqueting table is unleashed. It can seat 160 guests. It's not a dinner service as you might imagine. The items don't all match, but there are masses of them. There's candelabra to act as centerpieces on the table. There's the cutlery and the silver gilt plate. It takes three days to lay the table. The service includes soup tureens, salt cellars, and even its own set of butter moulds, and is the legacy of George IV in the 19th century. George IV was a great spendthrift. He didn't care whose money it was as long as it wasn't his. The government were concerned that there was no heir, and they felt that he should get married and produce an heir, and he kind of blackmailed the government because he was in such debt. He said, OK, I'll get married, but you've got to pay my debts first. 
So the government paid his debts, he got married, he didn't like his wife, and he went back on a spending spree again. And a lot of what we see in the Royal Collection today is as a result of George IV's spending spree. A state dinner takes four months to prepare and is ultimately overseen by the Queen. The state visit is very important to the United Kingdom because it's about relations, it's political relations, diplomatic relations, and hopefully trade relations. And the Queen really does put on a tremendous show. And because she puts on a tremendous show, because there she is, she's head of state of the UK, and she will go and inspect it a couple of hours before the dinner actually takes place. If something is out of place, she'll say it's out of place, and she has a very keen eye for perfection. And after dinner, the Queen has also been known to give her guests a guided tour of some of the old masters that hang in the palaces. The Queen knows more about every item than any tour guide. But I don't know if we really have the feeling that she has a huge personal interest in art, except perhaps as it shows horses. What sort of art does the Queen like? Well, I suppose first coming to mind are horses. Yes, she loves horses, she loves dogs. She likes people as well, but not necessarily in that order. The Queen doesn't profess to be an art aficionado or an art historian. It's the old cliche, isn't it? She likes what she likes. Perhaps some of the greatest collectors of more recent times are Queen Victoria and her consort, Prince Albert, who added their treasure to the royal collection. I think Victoria and Albert, part of their relationship was entwined through art. So I don't think you can put enough emphasis on the fact that almost art was a glue that forged their love between themselves. So they both loved drawing and etching. They both visited exhibitions together. They both sat for portraits and photographs. Queen Victoria and Prince Albert shared a great enthusiasm for art and they would often exchange artistic gifts on occasions such as birthdays and Christmas. Prince Albert especially was very knowledgeable. We owe a lot to Prince Albert. One of Albert's big things was, you know, education. His legacy, in a sense, is what's been called Albertopolis, you know, the complex of museums in South Kensington, the Victorian Albert Museum among them. So he really began putting things together so that the British people had a chance to see more of what the British monarchy were viewing every day. Victoria's choice of art at times reveals the passionate relationship that the couple enjoyed, such as Florinda by German painter Franz Xaver Winterhalter. This is a painting that Queen Victoria bought for Prince Albert's birthday in 1852. And if you think of our slightly buttoned up, straight-laced idea of Queen Victoria, this picture looks rather surprising. You know, Queen Victoria is the monarch who famously, when she visited the V&A Museum, they had to go around and put fig leaves on all of the sculptures. And what you're looking at here is a picture based on a story of the Princess Florinda. And she's gone out to bathe in a pool close to her castle in Toledo with her maidens. And all of them are in varying degrees of undress. Now, what Florinda doesn't know is that the young Rodrigo is spying on her from behind the bushes. And the story is that Rodrigo fell in love with her so passionately. He then seduced her, which made her father, the Count, so angry that he actually went out and encouraged the Arab invasion of Spain. And during the battle, Rodrigo was killed. What I find very interesting is that this painting was chosen to hang in Osborne House, the most intimate of the royal residences, over their working desks where Victoria and Albert would do their paperwork. And so it was an image that they would both be enjoying on a daily basis. And I think being such an essential image of semi-clad women uh, says quite a lot that they chose that um, in their, their private working space. 
we know that they had a very loving and close relationship. Queen Victoria can't have been a prude. She had nine children with Albert. Victoria and Albert always gave each other special Christmas presents. One year, the Queen commissioned Edwin Landseer to paint a portrait of Albert's dog, Eos. Edwin Landseer was Queen Victoria's favourite artist, and he even gave the Queen drawing lessons. He was particularly celebrated for his portrayals of animals. The painting of Albert's dog, Eos, is a quite distinctive element in the, in the Royal Collection because it shows this beautiful dog that Albert loved a bit. In a way, it's almost a portrait of Albert because it shows the dog standing by certain items of clothing of the princes, his hat and cane. It also shows elements of Albert's personality because a dog is waiting for his master, he's very affectionate, and these qualities of love and commitment were qualities that obviously he showed to not only his wife, but also the, the British nation. Lancia's paintings have been known to fetch millions on the open market. The value of Eos is doubtlessly increased by the significance it had for Victoria, particularly after Albert's early death from typhoid at the age of only 42, leaving her a widow for the next 40 years. The Royal Collection also holds special mementos of the other great loves in her life, her nine children. In the collection at Osborne House is a remarkable group of marble sculptures. They're based on plaster casts that were taken from her children as they slept. Queen Victoria kept these marble sculptures in her private apartments at Buckingham Palace. I think it tells us quite a lot about her love of her family and the fact that she wanted to project an image of, of, of a loving mother. Under Victoria and Albert, the Royal Archives also began to burgeon with a new form of art, photography. The Queen and her husband understood that the power of their image would be crucial to the success of Victoria's reign. And what Albert and Victoria did in particular was they presented themselves as the model family, as the perfect family, mother, father, children. But also, I think, because of the Reform Act, because of the greater basis of middle-class power in terms of voting that was having power in the country, Victoria really is catering to a middle class, and that very much is presenting herself as quite an ordinary, humble-looking family. Like these portraits in which Albert and Victoria are just looking like they're chatting in Windsor Castle, in which Victoria looks like any Victorian mid-century housewife. She's got a very ordinary outfit on. They look like any ordinary couple, which was really quite revolutionary at the time. Every king normally has himself painted in bling or intimidating, and here's Victoria looking like anyone's next-door neighbour. Like Victoria before her, our current queen is now the custodian of the Royal Art Collection, which has grown to become one of the largest in the world. But it is a collection that has not been without its scandal and betrayal. How do you feel about being called a traitor now? I can't deny it. And the family's treasures have also been a target for theft. This was one of the great jewellery heist mysteries of the 20th century. The Royal Collection is one of the largest art collections in the world, made up of an estimated one million objects. And with a market value of almost 10 billion pounds, it has a global attraction to dealers, curators, and historians. Well, the Royal Collection is vast. It is colossal. You can spend a week describing the Royal Collection. That is how vast it is. But the art world is notorious for scandal, and the Royal Collection is no exception. The art world is famously murky, and the royal family are not immune from that side of the industry. Most recently, Prince Charles came very close to having his fingers burnt when he agreed to take on 17 paintings from 
billionaire James Stunt, who was the ex-husband of Petra Ecclestone, and he had offered these paintings to the Prince of Wales. They ranged from Picassos to Dali's, and the Prince of Wales loved them, thought they were fantastic, wrote to James Stunt thanking him for the very kind loan, and actually hung these paintings at Dumfries' house. The paintings were estimated to be worth over 200 million pounds, but their real value turned out to be rather less. The problem was that it turned out that four of the 17 paintings were actually fakes. There was a Picasso, in quotes, a Picasso, a Chagall, a Dali, and a Monet water lily painting, which were clearly fakes. So this was a staggeringly embarrassing incident for Prince Charles and for the royal family. The story broke and was even more embarrassing when it was announced that a very famous art forger in America, a man called Tony Tetro, who still makes copies of paintings today, admitted that he had made these pictures at his kitchen table in California. James Stunt has since denied any wrongdoing and told the media that all his art is genuine. The controversy led Prince Charles to immediately remove all the artwork from Dumfries' house. It's not unusual at all for works to be loaned all over the world, often on long term, for many, many years. But I think when you insure four paintings like these, you've really got to know that you're dealing with the real thing and that the person who they've been loaned from is a reliable and safe pair of hands, a serious collector. Charles's brush with illegitimate art wasn't the first time that the royal family or their collection of treasures had been dragged into a scandal. Over 80 years ago, Edward VIII was believed to have taken jewels from the royal collection as a gift for his lover, Wallace Simpson. She was a woman who loved jewels. She had wonderful taste in jewels. She had this amazing collection that was worth millions and millions. Absolutely incredible collection. I suppose Edward thought it was fine to give jewels to Woo Wallace because she'd be the queen. But as it turned out, she wasn't the queen and he had to abdicate his throne. In 1946, the controversial former monarch returned to the UK with his wife for the first time since his infamous abdication. But in mysterious circumstances, all of Wallace Simpson's jewellery, including the jewels from the royal collection, disappeared. They went out for the evening to the theatre and Wallace Simpson was specifically asked beforehand would she like to pack away her jewels in a strong box and she said no, no, it's fine, they're fine as they are. But lo and behold, when they came back that evening, they found that a small box of jewels had been stolen. But the mystery deepened immediately because there was a string of pearls belonging to Queen Alexandra that was found on a local golf course. And immediately there were conspiracy theories all over the place. It really all seemed a bit suspicious. Was it someone in the royal collections trying to steal the jewellery back? Or was it Edward himself trying to do some kind of insurance job? If you're going to steal all that kind of jewellery, you would expect it to be immediately broken down, sold off, not end up in a golf course somewhere. Despite an arrest for the theft being made in 1947, millions of pounds worth of Wallace Simpson's jewellery was never found. This was one of the great jewellery heist mysteries of the 20th century. But the biggest scandal to hit the royal collection wouldn't be fake art or a mysterious disappearance. It would turn out to be the man in charge of the entire collection. After the Second World War had ended, the Queen's father, King George VI, employed art historian Anthony Blunt as surveyor of pictures and in charge of the royal collection. Anthony Blunt does fit in to a long line of, of royal servants, but those who have been particularly associated with art. He was a great art lover, and he really was devoted to the art collection. After Elizabeth succeeded her father to the throne, Anthony Blunt continued in his role, curating and maintaining all of the Queen's art. And in 1956, 
he was rewarded with a knighthood. He was a very effective and very talented member of staff. And what is historically the most interesting? Well, I suppose, really, the three heads of Charles I, which was executed for Charles I um, and was to be sent to Rome. But whilst the art Anthony Blunt collected was authentic, his own identity turned out to be illegitimate. What the general public didn't know is that Anthony Blunt had been one of the Cambridge spies during World War II. He was involved in very serious spying, and yet it simply wasn't known. In 1964, MI5 discovered that Anthony Blunt was the fourth Cambridge spy, alongside Donald MacLean, Guy Burgess, and Kim Philby. Together, they were considered among the biggest traitors in British history. Three of the spies had already defected to the Soviet Union after their cover was blown. But Blunt managed to keep his identity a secret, even from the British monarchy. The man never had any access to uh, any official secrets or any documents, and all, all that he had access to what was in the Royal Collection. But he was seen as a threat at the time of his exposure. In return for a full confession, Anthony Blunt was granted immunity by MI5 and his espionage was kept secret from the public. He continued to work for the Queen as her surveyor of pictures until his retirement ten years later. Amazingly, after this discovery, of which the Queen was told about, Anthony Blunt was allowed to continue working at Buckingham Palace and continued his relationship with the Queen, all the while knowing, both him and her, that, that it had been discovered that he was, in fact, a spy. Many spies were executed after the war, but Blunt certainly got away with it. The shocking secret remained under wraps until 1979 when Anthony Blunt was exposed by Margaret Thatcher in the House of Commons after she evoked her parliamentary privilege to reveal his true identity. Parliamentary privilege means that a MP can say something in Parliament without being sued. Mrs Thatcher actually said it, that Anthony Blunt had been a spy against the British interest and therefore it was really strongly felt that he simply shouldn't have a knighthood. Um, how, how are you feeling, uh, just a moment? Um, <laughs> John Cancross would later be uncovered as the fifth and final member of the spy ring. But the discovery of Anthony Blunt, who had worked for over 20 years alongside the Queen, remains the most shocking. After 1964, you were still working with and for the royal family. How did you reconcile that with the fact that you are a traitor? I felt that I was, I'd been given a job to do, and I felt I could go on doing it for the royal collection. When you made your confession, did the Queen know? Well, this is a question, again, which I shall, I, mean, I, I would rather not discuss, because my information is, uh, so to speak, second, if not second-hand, it's rather vague. He lost his knighthood, um, and he lost his job, uh, and he died a lonely, broken old man. How do you feel about being called a traitor now? I can't deny it. Away from scandal and upset, the Royal Collection remains as popular and fascinating as it did hundreds of years ago. But which of the million pieces of art is the most valuable? And how many more of the collection's treasures are still waiting to be found? There's every possibility that there may be other hidden masterpieces in that collection waiting to be rediscovered. Hidden within the royal palaces are some of the most valuable and unusual pieces of art ever to have been made. The royal collection actually holds one of the most extensive collections of Fabergé objects anywhere in the world. There are around 600 objects 
And that ranges from the famous Fabergé eggs through to flowers, commemorative plaques, jewellery, boxes. Some of these treasures, made by the jeweller Karl Fabergé, were gifts that the Russian royal families would give each other for Easter. The enthusiasm for Fabergé pieces was soon taken up by their British royal cousins. One of the starting points for the royal collection of Fabergé was a commission made by Edward VII as a Christmas present for Alexandra sometime in the 1900s. And what it is, is a collection of carved hard stone figures of animals that are in the royal farm at Sandringham. Carved from all sorts of different stones, wonderfully skillful pieces of craftsmanship. Semi-precious stones themselves, but perhaps a little garnets or rubies inset for eyes and things like that. And they must have been a charming present to receive. But maybe the most iconic of the Queen's collection is this bejeweled mosaic Easter egg, a gift given by Nicholas II, the last Tsar of Russia, to his wife, the Tsarina. Inside are images of the Tsar's children. It's absolutely one of the masterpieces. Designed by a designer called Alma Pill, who had the idea for the egg when she saw her mother-in-law working on a piece of embroidery. And that's what the egg looks like. So it's a lattice work of platinum, and into that platinum are inset all these different precious and semi-precious stones, create this wonderful image of the egg. In 1917, the Tsars were deposed in a bloody revolution and murdered in a house in Siberia. The eggs are one of the most iconic items of their rule. This one was bought by Nicholas's cousin, George V, in 1933 for 250 pounds. Today, it's likely to be worth several million. And the Queen showed Kate her collection of Fabergé eggs. The Duchess said they were amazing. They're amazing. Are these kept in a cupboard? Nobody can afford these things nowadays. I did have an opportunity of seeing a lot of the treasures in the Royal Collection up close, even to the point of actually holding a Fabergé egg. I had to put gloves on to do it, but holding a Fabergé egg was quite exciting. I'd never owned a piece like that, but holding it was quite special. Queen Mary was given the egg as a gift by her husband. Mary herself was an avid collector. Her great-grandson, Prince Charles, who is the Royal Collection's chairman, has also added to its treasures over the years. In 2015, he asked 12 artists to create portraits for some of the last D-Day veterans, a patronage that he took over from the Queen Mother. One of the artists that was commissioned was Ishbel Myerskopf. So we were asked to do a painted sketch of our subjects, not finished, which is quite an odd commission to be given. So it wasn't a drawing and it wasn't a finished painting. It was a really unusual request. I think, I think it was very clever because we weren't going to have long sittings with these men. Ishbel was invited to paint Raymond Titch Rayner, a member of the parachute regiment who'd fought at D-Day. He got shot and then traveled the seven miles through the water to meet up with the rest of his battalion. He was an amazing man, actually. He was incredibly energetic and loved to tell me all about it. He never slumped. He kept telling me that this was a very important job and I had to do it very well because Prince Charles had asked me to do it. All the D-Day vets met at the Queen's Gallery to see their portraits unveiled for the first time. But sadly, Titch died before the exhibition opened and never saw Ishbel's work of him. Prince Charles spoke to me. He really liked the painting and so we talked a lot about that and we talked a lot about Titch and how sad it was that he wasn't there and the amazing things that he did. Ishbel's work is now a part of the illustrious Royal Collection. It's very exciting to be part of the Royal Collection. I grew up with my father telling me about the Holbein drawings and, and all the fantastic things that were in the collection and if he were alive, he'd be very excited to think that I had work in it. And I think it's very important that new work is commissioned, especially work like this, which it commemorates how the ordinary man can do something extraordinary. Titch's portrait has now joined over 7,000 paintings in the collection, 
which includes priceless canalettos and one of the largest archives of da Vinci drawings in the world. The collection is so huge that sometimes there are treasures buried within it which have remained hidden for centuries. For over 300 years, this image of the calling of Saints Peter and Andrew lay in a storeroom at Hampton Court Palace until an Italian expert had a hunch that it might be the work of one of the world's most celebrated painters, Caravaggio. He was most famous for his use of this technique called chiaroscuro, which literally means light and dark. So very dramatic theatrical effects of light, but also he was renowned because he used regular people who he met in the street in Rome for his sitters. And that was seen as completely irreligious and revolutionary. You know, here were saints and apostles and images of Jesus and the Madonna, but they were actually regular men and women just picked off the street with their rough, interesting, asymmetric faces. So that was seen as incredibly daring. The art conservation team decided to discover if the hunch was right. Could the Queen's picture be a lost Caravaggio? Conservators peeled off layers of dirt and dust. They corrected things that have been badly restored in the past. And in doing so, at the end of 2006, there was this amazing announcement. This actually is the real lost Caravaggio. And there are a number of ways that they could tell that this was the real painting connected to Caravaggio's very specific technique. So for example, he didn't do underdrawings on his paintings. Instead, he scored lines into the first layer of wet paint, usually using the handle of a brush. And then he painted directly on top of that. And they found that technique as they did the x-rays and they did the conservation work on this painting. This work is now one of the most treasured in the Queen's collection with some estimates valuing the painting at 50 million pounds. And I think it's extraordinary to think that such an unrecognized masterpiece could have been sitting in the Royal Collections. But of course, the collection is vast. It has over a million objects, which includes in the painting collection alone over 7,000 paintings. So there's every possibility that there may be other hidden masterpieces in that collection waiting to be rediscovered. The Royal Art Collection continues to grow and is seen by millions of people each year. But how much of it was lost when tragedy struck in 1992? I had a phone call from a radio station in Berkshire saying, can you tell me about the fire? And I was quite surprised. I said, what fire? And they said, oh, there's a fire at Windsor Castle. The Queen was extremely upset. And who really owns the magnificent collection of masterpieces? The monarch or us? The collection has grown for almost 400 years, with many of its items on display to the public across the UK. It is part of the national heritage that we have this collection, that we are lucky to have this collection, and lucky that we are able to show this collection to millions of people every year. But much of the art remains private and for royal eyes only. So who really owns this magnificent collection? We've got to make very clear that the Queen does not own the royal collection. She is its custodian. She, she owns it as, as Queen, as sovereign, but she doesn't own it personally. These are all silk ties from Shane Connolly. Yes. It is the nation's collection of art. She is the caretaker, if you want, of the collection. She, she holds it in trust for the nation. Today, the Royal Collection can be visited at several residences across the UK. But at the start of Queen Elizabeth's reign, the Royal Collection was completely private despite the British taxpayer funding its upkeep. There was a feeling about the Royal Collection was, well, we're paying for it, why is it all behind closed doors? In 1962, the Queen attempted to address the issue by opening the Queen's Gallery, allowing the public to see items from the Royal Collection for the very first time. The gallery was, once upon a time, the Queen's Chapel private chapel at uh, Buckingham Palace, but he got bombed during the war. 
and uh, there wasn't really a need for a private chapel at the palace anymore and it was Prince Philip who came up with the idea well, why don't we create a gallery in what used to be the chapel of Buckingham Palace a new art gallery presents a wonderful opportunity for the public to see some of the treasures owned by the Queen the opening of the Queen's Gallery came at an important moment, the early 60s, when there was a huge awareness that the royals needed to make themselves and their possessions more accessible to people. Rembrandt's Lady with a Fan, acquired by George IV in 1819. One outstanding masterpiece from the collection. This was an opportunity of bringing the royal collection to the masses. A royal portrait to end this glimpse of a truly royal collection. And it's worked so well and it has grown to what it is today. The Queen took further steps to connect the royal collection and the public, but only after disaster struck in 1992. I was actually in my office at Buckingham Palace in the press office and um, I had a phone call from a radio station in Berkshire saying, can you tell me about the fire? And I was quite surprised. I said, what fire? And they said, oh, there's a fire at Windsor Castle. The Queen's favoured residence had been engulfed in flames after a faulty spotlight ignited a curtain. The Queen was extremely upset. Windsor has a great attachment to the Queen. I suppose it's the biggest attachment she has after Balmoral Castle in Scotland. 115 rooms in Windsor Castle succumbed to the tragic blaze, which continued long into the night. But miraculously, only two works of art from the Royal Collection were lost in the fire. Well, the impact of the fire on the Royal Collection, fortunately, was quite minimal but the monarchy was really under the cosh because nobody knew how this was going to be paid for. In order to fund Windsor Castle's 62 million pound restoration, the Queen decided to open up several state rooms within Buckingham Palace to the public. And within a week, bookings for the next three years were sold out. Changing the guard at Buckingham Palace always popular with tourists, but from tomorrow, nearly half a million people will have the chance to see inside. The Queen also established the Royal Collection Trust, a charity that would ensure the upkeep of all the royal art. For just two months and eight pounds, 18 state rooms are on show. The Trust would be funded by the cost of admission, as well as the odd bit of memorabilia we also have got a terrific range of merchandise. It's so good, look at this tie. Now that is, is part of this year's merchandise. After Windsor Castle's restoration was complete in 1997, more royal residences opened to the public. Have a lovely day. Thank you, just go to the middle doors, please. Thank, Thank you very much. And last year, almost eight million people saw items from the royal collection. But debate continues as to whether the public should have more say in what is included in the lineup. There's always been a, a very delicate balance between monarchy and, and public because the monarchy is one thing and the public is something else. And uh, yes, there are those who say that it should be joined up, but how joined up should it be? The Queen has the final say in terms of what is curated for the royal collection, what goes on display, and where, of course, these priceless pieces of art are, are displayed. The Royal Collection has always been added to by living monarchs particularly and other members of the royal family. And that goes all the way back to Charles I. I think it's interesting too that living monarchs now and members of the royal family continue to commission into the collection. Prince Charles particularly, who's always had a great love of art and architecture, has commissioned a number of works. And I think that really reiterates the point that the Royal Collection is a living, breathing collection. It continues to grow and flourish today. But with an already slimmed down monarchy and an eventual changing of the guard, what does the future hold for the Royal Collection? 
I'm not sure that any modern royals are collectors in quite the way that some of their predecessors have been. Prince William started out studying art history, but art history is one field. The future of art is another. It is too early, perhaps, to know how he'll feel able to add to the royal collection. Perhaps the Duchess's interest in photography gives some clue as to a way ahead. The Duchess of Cambridge, herself an art history graduate from St Andrews University, is an accomplished photographer. The first time that the world saw Princess Charlotte up close with her brother, Prince George, was when her mother released these photos. The shots, I think, by a photographer could be quite formal, and she wants to have much more sort of action shots, much more intimate shots. And really, I think that's very much her way of giving out this vision of the family, vision of her family, which it is one of happy lives of the children, and they are living a comparatively ordinary life. At the end of the day, they're being photographed by their mother, and that really comes across in the pictures, which are very candid, very natural, and very beautiful. Could Kate's passions and values be key to the future of the Royal Art Collection? Kate has used her royal position to really put the spotlight on art and photography. She's the patron of the National Portrait Gallery, and quite recently she's launched an exhibition called Hold Still, and she has asked members of the public to submit photographs capturing their private lockdown moments. And, you know, in doing that, she is, she's really using that, that spotlight that she has got to put it onto an issue that she cares about, something that she feels is important. The art world, the whole concept of where art lies, is changing immensely. So who knows what the future of the Royal Collection will be. treasures. Behind palace doors, largely hidden from view, lies one of the royal family's most magnificent assets, the royal collection. We often quantify the Queen's huge wealth in terms of palaces, but we mustn't forget the royal collection. There's one million objects, it's valued at 10 billion. The Royal Art Collection holds a vast range of items that includes much more than just paintings. The Royal Collection is one of the largest and most important collections of art in the world. Drawings, paintings, sculptures that form part of this collection, um, and they are spread around 13 different residences, including Buckingham Palace and Holyrood House at Edinburgh. With some 7,000 paintings, a vast number are royal portraits. And one face appears time and time again. Our Queen, Elizabeth II. More than 100 artists have painted the Queen, of course. But very often, the occasion for a portrait, whether painted or photographic, has been some memorable occasion.